Fabio, in t- in terms of, I don't normally like like get into these these uh, these discussions about like you know what is the state of car design in the future and all this stuff. But at times it's important to ask these. It's definitely important to ask these questions. Um, and I think that um, you know speaking to somebody like yourself, it would be stupid for me not to ask um, you know what what you see us needing to do in terms of going forward, you know, to, to, to innovate, because it seems like in, in the car design space, you know, you could argue that everything's been done. So then you get some strange concepts where they're just adding, adding, adding. And, um, and then you get the other, the other extreme where it's super simplistic and there's, and it's very clean and everything. And that's great. But then that can also be criticized for not being innovative enough. So where do you see r- true innovation happening in the car design space? Well, um, of course, I, I understand your, 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 your fear of this type of discussions because we could easily get into many complicated uh, uh, situations. And uh, <clears throat> what I feel is that probably... Um, It's a unique opportunity to be a car designer in this moment because we are going through a period which is probably the biggest revolution on on the automotive industry since since, uh, 120 years ago when uh, the car started and suddenly they discover the uh, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, from Ford and, and suddenly all the car became something more than simple coach, coach work with, with, some, with some engine on it, you know. So we are going through a major transformation, a major changes. There are some incredible technology that are basically changing completely the paradigm of, of, of how a car should be done and how a car or even the purpose of the car. There will be so many different forms, not physical form, forms of interpretation of what a car could be. And uh, being a designer today should be, a designer today should be the guy who try to drive this process, try to drive this evolution, try to show a vision, uh, even experimenting. But when I'm saying experimenting and showing a vision, it doesn't mean I'm going to do a car with the front end more squared or a car with the with the side completely uh, soft it's not that it's just you know you you have a car that before was composed by a, a, a powertrain with all of these cinematical and mechanical connections and the position of the engine the dimension of the engine the connections would define already the whole volume and the whole uh, proportion of the car now we have motors that can be put anywhere. We have batteries that could be flat below the, the floor or could be positioned somewhere else. We have hydrogen with a fuel cell and gas ta- and, and, and hydrogen tanks. All of those things are also not connected cinematically each other. They are connected just through wires. So they can be positioned in many different ways. And that would give an incredible opportunity to completely transform the car object to maybe define many different typology of cars but what i see i see that we are we keep on on, on drawing suvs suvs or super sports car and just pretending to be disruptive because we do some hard edges everywhere or because we do some stripes of of, of lead led that, that's superficial. That's styling. Styling is part of design, but it's not design. So design is the concept. I think in this moment, there would be an incredible need of people who try to reconsider everything in, in depth and, uh, and find maybe new expression, totally new expression. I've asked this question a few times before, but I, I still, and I keep coming back to it, but like, you know, where is the Renault Twizy? Where is the Volkswagen Niels? Like where are vehicles like that? 
I see such a great opportunity to really do something cool in that space. And yet nobody's really doing stuff like that. Yeah, maybe it's because everyone is a bit, uh, there is a big insertion. I think also the, the two years we went through with, uh, with the pandemic uh, didn't help. But probably now there is even more the need to do it because uh, probably we have been all facing a situation that we didn't expect it. And it, it, it could be a great accelerator of change. Um, I think it could be the opportunity for the one who will be very brave to start to do things. Now you have also two different ways. You have, you have the traditional car makers who are struggling to invest, change, transform their whole big structure, like uh, not to, to become the dinosaur of car design and disappear. And on the other hand, you have brand new startups, sometimes a bit ingenuous, many times a bit ingenuous, sometimes even uh, a bit too pretentious, trying things that are completely pointless or just because they don't have the, the knowledge. Um, but then you have some that will, uh, will succeed. You have uh, new countries that are suddenly creating many different brands, starting directly with new technologies. And this will also be an incredible accelerator of change, even for the traditional car makers. So we are going through this phase, I guess, within the next um, five, ten years, there will, be, there will be some radical changes coming. For sure, for sure. On the subject of big OEMs, like, do you see, do you see them still remaining relevant in fifty years' time? Because their business model, in general, seems to be so reactive to, um, you know, what what they see in the market. It's and it's always like, oh, well, we see this company is doing really well with electrification, so we all need to go into electric, or. Uh, and then, as you highlighted, they've got these big complex structures that are, they take five years to just make a decision. And I think that, you know, in, in some respects, what's, well, in, in actually every respect, what's gotten a big OEM to success today is definitely not the kind of thinking that they need to be relevant in another 50 or 80 years time. Sure. And I wonder, like, mm. what is your, what is, what do you think about that? But I think again, as uh, as always, there is not a single uh, uh, way of doing things, and there is not black and white, uh, right and wrong. Um, I think a big OEM, a traditional OEM, have uh, the advantage of knowing what it means to do a car have the advantage of having very sophisticated process and, uh, and skills to be able to transform an idea, even a radical idea, into a, a reality. What they lack, they lack the courage to suddenly throw away uh, their hundred years of history or uh, their structure and change it radically uh, because it's not easy. Young uh, startups or young companies, <clears throat> they have much more flexibility. But at the same time, you have seen they, they, they don't handle the, the all uh, very complex and heavy pros process of making a car. You have seen even big companies like uh, we have heard about, uh, about Apple or about uh, Dyson trying to, to get into the car business and then suddenly stopping and then re, you know, wondering. And I've seen also giants from Chinese uh, IT company trying to do that, not always succeeding. I think little by little they learn. They will learn that it's not so easy and it's not something that uh, is not like doing telephones or electronic consumer products where you have high margins. A car, you, you really have huge investment and very low margins. And so they will succeed, but their success will push the other one to accelerate and take the decision, which it means probably you will have a few of the new one who will be very leading and few of the old one will be able to, to challenge and to keep the pace. And most of the other will, uh, will fail. So... It's, it's, a, it's a, an interesting period. 
Fabio, I'm going to take a, a bit of a left turn now at the moment. Um, we all know, yeah. we all are very aware of, of um, the great work that you've done over the years. And I, I um, for example, I love the, I mentioned to you before, I love the, the Fittipaldi uh, concept um, and, uh, and also the Gran Luso Coupe. But I want to ask you, and I also love the H2 speed, and that's oh, I'm going to ask you a little bit about that. I know um, that car was um, it's a, it's obviously this hydrogen car with this uh, this new technology, and the supposed inspiration was the Ferrari Sigma Grand Prix uh, concept from 1969, and you were as I understand it, your, your, your bosses or your superiors at the time when you made, your, made the original proposal, they were like, but there's no, the, this car is a completely different car. Can you talk a little bit about that, um, about the balance of taking inspiration from a past product and not going down the retro or future retro route? Mm. Uh, yeah, well, well, first of all, thank you, because uh, I have a particular affection to that, uh, that project. Uh, personally, it's one of, of the projects I feel more uh, deeply attached because it represents well my way of doing design. Um, I also like to speak about that because, as you said, it was not my boss. It was uh, internally at Pinifarina, it was always straightforward and clear, and they gave me all the uh, the total uh, freedom to do to do what I wanted, but it was the perception after from the press or maybe from other uh, specialists who had some hard, some difficulty from some time to time to connect the two, which I, is understandable. But uh, I, I'll tell you what I think. Um, when I, I in in these years I spent at Pininfarina, my my intention was to rebuilt and redefine the um, the values the visible values and the perception of the company <clears throat> by revitalizing really the the main axis of pininfarina uh, historical uh, uh, values so for example like of course purity of design uh, elegance of proportion and innovation and at the same time, trying to express this through different fields that Pininfarina has been always applying them. For example, when we did the, the, the Sergio, it was more about pa passion, emotion, an extreme uh, you know, uh, performance car. Um, when we did the Gran Lusso, it was like getting back to do the real work of Carrozzeria, taking a brand, reinterpreting in a modern way, coherent with the value of that brand and being able to be li like a, a, a tailor who makes the best suit on top of a body of someone. And that was, again, part of the tradition of Pinifarina. But the other tradition that not many people remember because they tend to believe only about the style part is about innovation and research. And, uh, for example, Pinifarina has been always doing Aerodynamic uh, research has been a pioneer in aerodynamic, has been doing research on new materials, research on, on uh, assembling, the way to assemble the car, or research on safety. And um, there was this, uh, of course, this uh, Sigma Grand Prix from 1968, which was a project done by Paolo Martin that uh, was an interpretation of, uh, of new safety device and technology applied to Formula One in a period when Formula One was very dangerous. And so they made this proposal full of those new uh, technologies that now you find somehow transform or evolve into contemporary Formula One or Indy cars. Many of those. And uh, I, myself, being there at Pininfarina, after having done the other one, I wanted to get back to do something that was showing also the, the other uh, uh, main uh, 
mainstream of, of Pininfarina, which was about technology and innovation. And we had this opportunity to discuss with uh, Green GT, which is a company who uh, pioneering in, uh, in uh, uh, can I say, in um, hydrogen fuel cell technology. And so we discussed and we decided, that why don't we do something for track high performance by using your technology? And for me doing that, it was almost 50 years after the Sigma. So it was like getting back to this tradition of Pininfarina, of proposing at a certain time a new technology or a new way to apply extremely uh, advanced on, uh, on high performance car. In that way, the, already from the beginning, even before existing, the project of the H2 speed was sort of getting back to the same level of the project of the uh, Sigma, not on the styling, on the contents, on the concept. That's what I meant. And so we started this project and uh, we did it not by trying to, to reproduce the styling of the Sigma. There was no point. We did it by reproducing the spirit and doing a new research. And so we designed the car by inside out. We designed the car first by trying to position the package of all the most important elements, the motors, the power, uh, the, the fuel cell, the big, uh, uh, gigantic uh, uh, tanks for the hydrogen, which are very intrusive. And all of those things also give you a, a weight balance for performance. So we work f at the first stage with, with a team of uh, one, two designers, more technical, the tech technician. And in digital, we try to build up this and check everything. And we define the package of the car. When we define the package of the car, we started to dress them up. And uh, it's funny because uh, there was one designer which was not one of the, uh, was very experienced, but not one of the most uh, fresh on his styling. And he started to work just by building up directly in alias some surfaces. And while he was doing that, we look at the car once from the top. And looking at the car from the top, we realized that there was like two sort of uh, uh, rhomboid uh, shape, Lausanne shape, overlapping. And it was creating the front, the rear and the cabin in the overlapping part. But this overlapping was leaving the two sides completely open where the big uh, hydrogen tank were. And we said, that's the concept of the car. We show the tanks. We put the tanks as a visible part of the design uh, and we designed the car through this very simple scheme and from there the design was just straight we we made it very simply the surfaces was very clean but there are some details that for example for a digital modeler or a clay modeler would be great to understand for example you have those edges on the front wheel arch and on the rear wheel arch on the fenders on the fenders, front and rear, they look like they are repeating the same. They look like just they are, they are uh, edges, styling edges. In reality, they are all coming from a a, a, a plane that a plan that is cutting through the surfaces, and those edges comes out perfectly because it's the result of the geometrical cutting. And nothing is just added; it's just by working and taking away mostly. And, um, and I'm very happy because the car doesn't have to look like the Sigma, but this, it gets back 50 years later the spirit of what the Sigma was. And then just to connect the two, I said, let's do it with the same color scheme, which is great because I thought doing a white car with flashy fluo colors, it was a quite uh, funky move. And, uh, and having the possibility, I thought also, not only about the car, I thought about at Geneva, we will show both of them on the stand. And that was really good. Unfortunately, many people just look at that like a styling thing and they were saying, oh, but it doesn't look like that one. Because that's not the point. That was not the point. And that goes also to the fact that so many, we see so many car maker, car designers, young students now, doing, uh, you know, retro design, doing resto modes. Um, 
great. I mean, it's fine. It's fantastic getting a bit of nostalgic thing. Actually, with electric cars, it could even become a sort of one main fashion trend, like having classic looking bodies on very advanced technologies. You have it already, like the Jaguar electric, the Jaguar E-type electric yes. and this type of cars. But when that main uh, stream becomes, when that vision of uh, retro design becomes the mainstream of uh, too many car design, then it starts to be a little bit dangerous, it starts to be wondering why those people are just looking back and they are not able to reinterpret this in a futuristic way. Do, do you not think it, that that's a very difficult thing to do as long as we keep this format of, look, you, st you still will need four wheels, but it's, you know, even I've, I've seen so many times where um, in, inside studios that projects that don't, you know, get to see the light of day where we try and do, where we try and tear up the rule book where you, you start with a blank canvas and you say like, you know, hypothetically, if we, if we started with these two, with these four wheels and we placed, you know, the passenger at a certain place, let's try and do something completely outrageous. Yet it's, it seems like you still somehow come up with the same results at the end of the day. I mean, there's variations, of course, but it doesn't, it still doesn't feel like true innovation. And I, again, to go back to the, the, the Twizzy or the, the Niels thing, I mean, isn't it, it, is it not the fact that we need to be exploring completely new architecture to innovate? I mean, it's not obliged. It's not everywhere and every time. Um, there are, to me, it should be one of the most important uh, purpose of design. But I don't say I don't see anything wrong on doing beautiful cars with sort of traditional proportion and traditional elegance if they get some, some new and fresh uh, spirit. Uh, what we tried to do with the BMW Gran Lusso was really that. Just doing a beautiful car, that's all. And uh, taking the best advantage of the proportion. Uh, at that time, we discussed with BMW people for a uh, few weeks about how much shorten the wheelbase, because the base was the old uh, 7 Series. And we ended up uh, to shorten it, uh, uh, if I remember well, 4 .7, 4, 47 millimeters or something like that. Because we thought that was the best combination of everything and also was possible to use uh, some, uh, imagine some, some um, potential modification in, in uh, production uh, intention. But... And then we did a, a classic car, nice and beautiful and looking modern enough. So that should be one of the way to express design. Then you might have the, the way to express by looking completely uh, innovative packages and, and, and uh, conceptual things. It would be nice if we try to get the best balance of all of those things and not only getting too much into the stylistic things. Look. One of the things got me very bored lately to, to be a car designer was just like designing another SUV. And uh, okay, this time we do it sharp. Next time we do it round. But it's still going to be a 2.5 ton huge thing that is completely nonsense. Would you be open to helping a company like BMW with their current situation? Because it seems, I, and I can't understand what I, I can't understand what's going on there, given the insane amount of talent that they've got inside their company, and it's it's um, and, and it I, I need to be clear in saying that I I don't even necessarily place that blame on the design director. You know, I I, I know that these 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 landscape these these corporations have got such an incredibly complex um, committee of people that unfortunately involve themselves. But I can't help but think that, you know, this is where a design director and, and, and his team, they need, to, they need to fight for against that. 
Well, uh, I would be pleased to help anyone who wants to, to be helped, but um, um, I wouldn't put it just for one particular car company. Um, there are, of course, there are, there are uh, situations where it's more visible, but uh, uh, I think it's something quite generalized. I think uh, it's something that is going on for the last uh, 10 years in, in a very consistent way and more visible way. I think is also influenced by the changes of the expectation of the markets. Uh, probably, you, you, you said about BMW, probably BMW will never sell so many cars like in this period by doing what they are doing. So probably they know exactly why they are doing it. Um, and uh, the, the point is, uh, <clears throat> as I said, we are going through a major period of change. And maybe what is working now on short term uh, is not really what will make the, this change. And, and it will be important to be ahead of it and being able to, to, to anticipate that. For example, again, uh, I'm particularly affection to, to, uh, to Renault as a company. I have been working 14 years for them. Um, Renault was a company when I was there who had always this spirit of trying some time to do something revolutionary, maybe it's typical of French uh, attitude, and being very uh, disruptive. Disruptive. I don't like the word disruptive, but they were trying to be as much as possible. And they did it in many, in many occasions. Not always it worked because you, you take the risk. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, vehicle like, like uh, the Tweezy you said, which probably is, is just a very, um, how can I say, just a, a, a very specific thing. It's not, it's not a main, uh, a main uh, mainstream uh, object, but a vehicle like the Scenic, the first Scenic. Renault came out with the, with the first Scenic, which as a design styling was, was not probably... Uh, so exciting and was quite uh, 80s, uh, 90s uh, stylish with those uh, sweepy curves everywhere. But um, it was the first uh, compact uh, MPV for the first and only compact MPV for maybe seven or eight years before the other one started to do them. And in those seven or, or eight years, Renault created a, a, a segment and just monopolize the segment. With the money that Renault created from this uh, uh, Scenic in these five, seven years, they bought Nissan. They bought the percentage they have now in Nissan. Wow. And they created at that time the alliance. So it means that if you are able to do the right things at the right time, you can change deeply the uh, the evolution or the history or the future of, of a company and of a society. Um, it's, it's something that you have to be, to be brave to go for that. And it's now the moment more important than ever to do it. But it requires vision. It requires vision, guts and, uh, and conviction. And of course, if you do everything you do is just based on immediate return, financial return, then you don't go that far. Because you have to invest first and you have to take the risk. Fabio, I, um, I wanted to, um, before, we, before we wrap up, I know that you have, mm. have been involved in, in, in both interior and exterior. And um, do you... The question that I have for you is whether or not you have a preference for one or the other. I, I, I like both. In fact, my biggest frustration during my career was that at a certain time, I was pretty good on doing exterior and that stopped uh, doing interior. So, sorry. And the fact that I was pretty good on doing interior stops me the possibility to keep on doing exterior as well. At the end, maybe I was probably doing the best things I could do. And that helped me a lot also in my career. Later on, I got back to do exteriors. And as a manager, I've been always doing both. Um, in my design teams, always, I try to push people to be able to do both. Because 
uh, a car is made out of both. Actually, a car proportion starts from the from the package of the interior, starts from the position of the of the pedals, and the sitting position. And if you got wrong that one, you you cannot get the right proportion. So I think a designer is able at the same time to know how to design exteriors and how to design interior is going to be a better designer. Working in a place like Pininfarina or a, or a consulting design studio, you cannot split so much these two disciplines because the flow of projects is not always even. Maybe you get three projects of exteriors in a row and then if you have just a department only for interior, then the guy stays there and, and don't know what to do. So I had specialists for exterior, specialists for interior, but most of the of the team was supposed to be able to do both and being flexible. And I think that's the best way to learn to learn uh, how to become a good designer. Fabio, do you think that this is a um, an Italian uh, mentality, or is that just you know being pragmatic about the business? Because I know that well, as I understand it, Ferrari is very much. Um, Sent, uh, set up like that where they kind of encourage people to do both. I know that you have uh, that, that that you can't necessarily comment on that specifically, but I, I um, there's not a lot of companies that I've worked in where that's been the case. You know, generally there's a, a specialism either way. No, I, I think I think it's a, from a company point of view, it's not bad to have a separate specific fields. And now are even more because it's not only interior, then you have color and trim, then you have graphic, then you have UI UX. And UI UX, for example, is becoming such a specialized uh, field that it goes on top of what maybe an interior designer can do. And, um, and then, for example, now we have themes that are specialized on lighting because lighting are such a complex projects and you need people who are always updated with, uh, with the best technologies, are in contact with uh, suppliers, and, uh, and they become really uh, specialized on that. So from a big company point of view, that is important. But I'm saying from a designer point of view, to be able to change from one side to the other and to be able to do a bit of one and a bit of the other is always a good thing. So I would suggest to any designer to try also in his, in his career to change department, you know. I don't mean the department should exist, but maybe some people should some, from time to time jump from one to the other to learn a little bit more. <coughs> Sorry. Fabio, what, what is it that you... Is there a single attribute that you could say um, was instrumental in you achieving what you've achieved in your career because there's a lot of you know there's there's plenty of there's plenty of people that become managers but they you know they might just go oh, okay well I'm quite comfortable here I've got my company car I've got a good pension I don't have too much responsibility but I've got an improved uh, salary so I'm just going to stay here at the moment or there are people that try mm -hmm. and get further ahead and they they and they simply can't is there is there something that's really obvious in your in your makeup that that is that has helped you achieve what you've achieved um i think i don't know if my advice could be good for for everyone but uh, in fact um i've never tried intentionally to make a career or to get a, a position or a um, I, I was when I was doing design I was so concentrated on my own design trying to do the best out of it not to be the best recognized but just you know for me what, what is important I'm basing not, not so much on the judgment of other people but I'm basing on a very tough and hard judgment of myself and um, I'm never satisfied what I do probably because I'm not so good but <laughs> But uh, um, I never tried, to, I always focus on what I was doing. And when the, 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 there is always a, a difficult moment on the career of a designer is to move from uh, 
creative uh, side to management side. And I've been trying to keep it as late as possible because uh, when, when, you are, when you are creative or when you are a good designer in some way, you try to, to keep on doing that and you try to, to, to express yourself through your work. And you always fear that uh, you know, becoming a manager will be going on meetings, uh, spending time discussing about uh, investments and timing. But at a certain moment, it's important to do that. And you discover that you can apply the creativity also in a totally different way. I also had the chance always to be able to find myself in situations where I was also managing little structures, for example. When I created the studio in Paris, uh, Renault Design Paris Bastille, it was an incredible opportunity because I had the chance that Renault was giving me the full responsibility to construct a team to find a place uh, to create the studio, not only the, really the studio physically, but also the structure, the way of working, the process. So it was a creative way, not applied directly to one project, but to the project of what yeah. should be a design center. And we took some very, very important decision at that time already in 2003 to work mainly uh, in, in digital, for example, in 2003, because we were in the center, we were in Bastille from the second to the fourth floor of a uh, 18, uh, 18 uh, um, century building, so we couldn't have a modeling uh, department. But um, yeah, I think one of the probably important points is being focused, being focused and very. Um, I don't know, lucido in Italian, lucid. I don't know if in, in English it means the same thing. Being the capacity to take the right decision at the right time and evaluating what is good and what is wrong, but not necessarily for your own career. I never did anything by looking at my own career. Actually, I have to admit, most of my changes were people asking me. Yes. So even, even to go... To get, you know, even to get back to Pininfarina, to get to Pininfarina after uh, 25 years or more abroad, it was not in my intention. I just got a phone call and they told me, what, what, would you be interested to check with Pininfarina? I said, Pininfarina? Why not? Because, uh, you know, I was the first uh, Pininfarina head of design after 80 years, 81 years the first one coming from outside. Wow. And I didn't expect it, but uh, I, 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 I took the decision to try it. It wasn't easy because it, it was probably the most difficult period of Pininfarina ever on, on, on its history at that time. Pro really from, from not only from design point of view, but from, from the company status and situation. So it was a risky, a risky choice, but, but I took it. Have there been any key people in your life that have been um, somewhat of a mentor? And if not a mentor, just a, um, an, a role model for you to go like, actually, like that's a really good way of doing things. Is there anybody that really, really stands out as an inspiration for you? Well, I, I could say that probably the person who uh, I, I feel much more <clears throat> that I have learned um, from, from that period was, was Patrick Lecamon at Renault because I spent the, the longest period there. I learned a lot also in my period in Japan and there wasn't one single person, but it was the whole experience. Funnily, I have to say I've learned a lot also from so, some... Uh, very bad managers that I had to to experience and I learned actually how not to how do not. that that's also a good thing yes, to learn yes Fabio I think we're gonna um we'll we'll probably wrap up now because I I, I just um yeah we I could carry on forever but we've got to stop at some point um <laughs> is there is there um any any specific advice that you that you would have maybe for for a young designer starting out today in this complex environment that we've got? 
well, I, I'm I, I'm not going to tell them to to learn how to draw, how to 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 do to use Photoshop, Elias, or whatever, because they are much better than me already from from the very beginning. And but I just would like to say, please keep in mind that that's not the only thing. That's not the most important thing. Most important thing is that you try to build your own. Uh, your own, uh, um, uh, how can I say, your own knowledge with full of information, with full of experiences. Be curious and be passionate about cars, but not only, not only. Try to learn many more things and don't think only about cars. Uh, you know, when someone knows everything about one single thing, he doesn't know anything about that thing. Wow! If you you know, is that that was a, a, a Mourinho, you know, the the the, the football trainer uh, saying that he said, if ever someone who knows everything about football doesn't know anything about football, because you have to learn many more things on, of life, of other things to know and to apply it on your own field, and that's the same for design. That is absolutely fantastic advice. Fabio, thank you so much. This is absolutely brilliant. I, I don't know what to say. I, I Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Brilliant. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Because I enjoyed it because I, I feel to talk freely because I have no, you know, I, I don't have anyone who is going to tell me something. <laughs> like, oh, you shouldn't say that. You should. no, I'm, I, I'm free. That, that's also another good thing that I've learned. Right. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Father.